afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you may or may not have heard. Sorry, okay. Is that better? Yes. Yeah. You may have heard that David has tested positive for COVID. So that is why I'm introducing our speaker today. Mrs. Sue Buckley is um, an amateur historian and has uh, had a lot of experience in transcribing wills from the 15th century. A big job because I think there are a lot of them and very interesting. But she's going to speak to us today on the Western marches in the 15th century with reference to Penrith. So give her a great welcome, please. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I was asked to do this talk originally on Richard III and Penrith, but I, I know Professor Mullet talked on that subject in the library a little while ago, so rather than cover the same ground again, I thought I'd go a bit further back into the 15th century and look at what was happening here before Richard was appointed as Warden of the West March in 1470. In other words, what did he find when he got here? Now, I don't know about you, but if anybody says 15th century, 1400s, I think about Agincourt, 1415. And then in the middle of the century, you've got the Wars of the Roses. And 1485, you've got Bosworth. Those are the 15th century. But actually, there was an awful lot of things going on up here. And when I started reading up on it, I was quite amazed at how much was actually happening on the border. So perhaps we should start by defining what is meant by the West March. Where was it? Was Penrith part of it? And what was expected of the 18-year-old Richard? He was only 18 when he first became warden, as warden of the West March. So what were the marches? Well, each side of the Scottish border was divided into three areas, east, middle, and west, by a treaty in 1249 between King Henry III of England and Alexander III of Scotland. And the boundaries are not very clear. If you Google on the internet for the West March, English West March, sometimes it's shown as Carlisle with a little bit round the outside of it. Sometimes it's shown as all of modern day Cumbria. So probably the truth is somewhere in between the two, but I think we can safely say that Penrith was part of the West March. So from about 1367, each march was governed by a separate warden who was appointed by the monarch. And the warden's duties were to guard the frontier, to confer with his opposite warden regularly for the good government of their area, to appoint subordinate warden officials, to supervise strongholds, suppress crime, give and obtain redress against offenders, pursue fugitives, hold domestic courts as well as international courts with the opposite warden, muster the march for defence as required, and generally keep good rule. So not very much involved in that job then, really. And for all that, they received something between £300 and £1,100 sterling, but they didn't necessarily always get it on time, if at all. Now, I had a look on the, the Bank of England website, um, and that £1,100 converts today to around £800,000. So they were getting quite a lot, but they had to use a lot of that to maintain the castles and that kind of thing. But in effect, what they were doing, they were maintaining private armies at the king's expense, which of course made them highly dangerous if they fell out with the crown. This is a quote from The Steel Bonnets by George MacDonald Fraser. To attempt to apply normal law and government to the border area was a waste of time and both countries had long recognized this. There grew up a body of local law and custom, often extremely complex, seldom consistent, and in practice all too rough and ready, by which the two governments attempted to keep their frontier subjects in order. It can probably be said to have worked moderately well in that it prevented a decline into complete anarchy. It was at least practiced, and it can 
it was, sorry, it was at least practiced by both sides with some cooperation. And the wonder is that it worked at all. Now, one of the principal duties of the warden was to meet with his opposite number on the Scottish side. And these became known as days of truce. And they developed an elaborate ritual of their own. But normally, the peace was respected, except for at least one notable occasion, which you maybe have heard of, Kinmont Willie. He'd been to a day of truce and he was going home. He should have been not touched at all, but they couldn't resist it. They went, the English went and grabbed him, brought him into Carlisle Castle, and the warden should have said, no, it's a day of truce, send him back. But he didn't. He put him into the castle. And uh, later on, he got sprung. So how many people were there? Well, a rough estimate, now this is in the 16th century, this is a bit later on, is 120,000 English and 50,000 Scots, which doesn't actually sound very much by today's numbers, but remember there'd been the Black Death in 1380, 1346 and then other instances of plague later on in that century, so there was quite a lot of depopulation. And the people have been described as barbarous, crafty, vengeful, crooked, quarrelsome, tough, perverse, active, and deceitful. But they were acknowledged to make good soldiers. And they generally wore light armor, mainly the jack, which was a sort of padded jacket with, with metal sewn into it as a sort of half armor, if you like. They rode sturdy little horses known as hobbies. And their weapons were the lance, the bow, and the billhook. And later on, of course, they got into firearms when they became more available. Family, and hence the surname, was important. First names were often duplicated, so nicknames abounded. You got Ill Will Armstrong, Dick's Davies Davy, and the one I really like, Archie Fire the Braze. And loyalty was to the head of the family rather than to any remote central government. But there was also quite a lot of fraternization and cooperation across the border, including intermarriage. Many Scots settled in England. There were also cross-border football matches, not that they were necessarily peaceful, and there were race meetings. But at the same time, you got deadly feuds between the families. So that's a bit of a background to what the march was. So I'm going to start this in 1378, because this is quite an interesting period for, for uh, Penrith. Um, does anybody remember the Ealing comedy film, Passport to Pimlico? One or two of you. This was where Pimlico was found to be part of Burgundy. Well, there was a similar sort of thing here in Penrith, because... Richard II, who was the king at the time, he made a treaty with the Duke of Brittany whereby he got Brest Castle in return for one English castle, 466 pounds per annum, and the manors of Penrith and Sowerby. So for four years or so, Penrith actually belonged to Brittany. But the Duke later allied with France, and therefore the treaty lapsed and Penrith was forfeit to the crown. I think it's doubtful if the Duke ever managed to get up here to have a look at what he'd got. However, William Strickland, we'll come back to him later, he's quite an important person in, in Penrith's history, he leased some of that property from the Duke with the right to build a Fort Alice. Now that sounds like something out of Lewis Carroll, doesn't it? But actually it was a small fortress. And that building would be the residence of the Duke, if he was in the area. And Strickland was later fined 13 and fourpence for taking manor lands without a royal license. But having paid his fine, his lease was renewed. And he went on to fortify the Fort Alice as a protection for the town. And it's now thought to be the building in Benson Row, known as the Peel Tower. But it may also be one of the towers in the castle. They're not quite sure, but it, it sounds as if it might be the one in Benson Row to me. Um, Strickland was actually ordained in 1381, and he was a great benefactor to Penrith, including the creation of Thacker Beck as a water supply. We've just been to have a look at Thacker Beck, 
outside the tourist office. And it sort of came from the River Petrel through to the River Emont. Yes, I'm getting nods from the audience. And uh, it was the first time that Penrith had had its own water supply, so he was a, a great benefactor. But the 1380s generally were times of Scottish raids and invasions, and there was extensive destruction. And we've got a, a record that the Scots, led by William the First Earl of Douglas, carried their ravages into Cumberland and, and Westmoreland. And they attacked and burnt the town of Penrith during the fair. Well, that was a bit nasty of them, you know, they could have waited till the fair was over. But bringing away much valuable plunder. Many were killed and taken prisoner. And all this was actually during what was supposed to be a time of truce. I've come to the conclusion that times of truce didn't actually mean anything on the border, but it might have given the citizens grim satisfaction to know that an outbreak of plague soon occurred in Scotland, and that was blamed on infection from the stolen goods. However, John of Gaunt, who was pretty active in England at the time, um, he negotiated a truce. which didn't actually mean anything very much either because in 1388, the Scots came down and they sacked Appleby and they destroyed Broome Castle. But finally, in 1389, we got a truce. Then there was peace. There was evidence of cross-border trade. But the, the towns that had been ravaged, in particular Penrith, um, were still trying to recover from the, the ravaging. Um, so in 1390, they got an exemption of the tenants and inhabitants of Penrith, their heirs and successors, for 10 years from all lay subsidies of 15ths and 10ths in consideration of their assessment of 17 pounds, 19 shillings and 10 pence being excessive and the town being now burned and destroyed by the Scots. So in other words, they'd assessed the tax liability of Penrith as being 17 pounds, 19 shillings and actually it wasn't worth anything like that because it had just been destroyed. So they were let off the tax for 10 years. So during the 1390s, you've got this period of peace and Penrith began to recover. So there's evidence of leases of waste ground being given out for building work. And the shape of the town was laid down during that period. It, it became obvious how the roads were going to be. There's evidence of craftsmen at work. And it also became a center for tanning and leather. And there was a rope works. So Penrith was really beginning to, to pick up a bit. Well, the same thing, of course, was happening, in, or should have been happening, in Carlisle. However, having got peace and safety from the Scots at last, in 1391, somebody went and accidentally set fire to Carlisle, and it burnt down. Well, that's typical Carlisle, isn't it? But King Richard II, um, he donated 500 oaks from the forest of Inglewood. Well, Inglewood was a royal forest that was in the Eden Valley between here and Carlisle. And he donated these 500 oaks, which, of course, went quite a, a good way towards rebuilding Carlisle, but still in wood, of course, so it was still vulnerable. And they also had to spend £126 on Carlisle's defences to bring it back up to scratch again. However, in Penrith, our friend Mr. Strickland, Reverend Strickland now, he established a chantry here in St. Andrew's Church, in the old church as it was then. And it may be that the chantry priest started a school. It was the kind of thing that chantry priests tended to do. They were there to pray for the soul of their, their um, benefactor, but that didn't take them the whole time. So quite often you find that they started some sort of a school. So that may have been the origin of education in Penrith. In 1396, Strickland was elected Bishop of Carlisle. But it, for some reason, which I haven't been able to identify, it was refused by the Pope. He wouldn't have it. And instead, Thomas Merck was made Bishop. Now he was a, a friend of Richard II. And round about this time, 1396, Ralph Neville of Raby comes into the picture. He was created the Earl of Westmoreland, and he married Joan Beaufort. Now, she was the daughter of John of Gaunt and therefore the granddaughter of King Edward III. 
and the Beaufort family were John of Gaunt's children by his mistress, Catherine Swinford. But eventually he married Catherine when his wife died, and therefore his children were made legitimate, the whole Beaufort family, four of them. And that caused all sorts of problems later on. But anyway, Joan was a good catch for Ralph. She must have been a really good um, heiress to have, have caught his attention. Uh, but the king was trying to build up the position of Ralph Neville in Cumberland, so he gave him the manners of Penrith and Sowerby. And the idea was to make the Neville family a counterbalance to the Percy family. Now, the Percys were over in Northumberland. They were great lords in the northeast, but they also tended to have the, a finger in the pie around here as well. And the idea was to sort of keep them in their place by building up the Nevilles as an opposition to them. Now, if you look at the window over there, you will see a portrait of Ralph and Joan Neville. When this church was rebuilt in the 18th century, they managed to rescue some of the stained glass, and that was reset into the new windows. But the people depicted were identified as being the Duke of York and his wife, Cicely. That is, the parents of King Edward IV and King Richard III. But a gentleman named William Dugdale, who was an official of the College of Arms, he visited Cumberland back in 1665 when the old church was standing and he made drawings of the original windows showing the full figures. Now I've got some here that I've printed off from the internet. You won't be able to see it from this distance but do come and have a look afterwards. Up there in the top right hand corner, those are the two figures that he drew. And you can, you can actually see that the head, particularly of the man, is the head that's shown in the window there. And the man is shown as wearing a sort of coat with the Neville arms on it. The woman has a, a cape, which has got the Neville arms on it, but underneath she's got a dress, which has got the royal arms on it. So that means that she was a royal person by royal birth, but she married a Neville. So that's going to be Joan Beaufort. So those heads are going to be Joan Beaufort and her husband, Ralph Neville which makes sense because they had been given the manor of Penrith. Now, these two had a, a large family. Ralph Neville had been married before. He had eight children by his first wife, and he then had 14 by Joan. And all of these children married into the local families, and they keep cropping up everywhere. The, the Nevilles get into everything. So... 1399, that was a bit of a, a pivotal year at the end of the, the previous century. John of Gaunt died, and his son, Henry Bolingbroke, then came and usurped the throne from Richard II, supported by both the Nevilles and the Percys at this time. And Ralph Neville, in fact, took part in Henry's coronation. He was appointed Marshal of England, and the grant of the two manors, Penrith and Sarby, was confirmed. So everybody up here seemed to be quite happy with the, the usurpation of, of Henry IV, as he became, except for Thomas Merck, the Bishop of Carlisle, he wasn't happy at all. He protested. So he was deposed as bishop and arrested. But he did escape. I don't know what happened to him eventually. But since the bishop, bishopric was now empty, uh, Strickland was nominated. This time he was nominated by the Pope, and he was opposed by the king. But he did eventually get confirmed in 1400, so poor old William Strickland had to wait for it, but eventually he got to be Bishop of Carlisle. So, Henry IV became king. And the first thing he did was break the truce with Scotland. He set off on an expedition into Scotland, which actually failed. He didn't do very well. And at that point, he must have decided that he didn't really want anything more to do with the borders. Uh, what the books say are, there was a decline in the level of direct royal intervention. Governance was left to the wardens. In other words, I'm going back to London. You lot get on with it. I don't want to know. Henry Percy was made first Earl of Northumberland. So at this stage, the Percys really did have the, the authority. But by 1402, the Scots were retaliating. They were invaded somewhere near Carlisle with about 12,000 troops. That's quite a, quite a big army for those days. Uh, we know about this because it was actually reported to Parliament by the king himself. 
but it was also a time of floods, disastrous harvests and scarcity of grain. But eventually the Scots got beaten back and the following year, 1403, the Percys decided to rebel against the king that they'd put there in the first place. But the Earl of Westmoreland remained loyal. So this is where you get the start of the Neville family as wardens of the West March. Ralph Neville, first Earl of Westmoreland, he became warden of the West March. And really, with a few short breaks, the Neville family continued as, mar as wardens all the way through till the end of Richard III's reign and Bosworth. But one little footnote to the Brittany episode. King Henry IV married, as his second wife, Joan of Navarre, who was the widow of that Duke of Brittany. And the king then claimed Strickland's Fort Alice for defense against the Scots in right of his wife. He said it should have belonged to his wife because she was the widow of the Duke who'd had it. Never mind that the treaty had been made null and void because he'd gone over to the French. But Strickland managed to hold on to it until he died in 1419, when eventually it was surrendered to the crown. So we've still got the Scots invading. This is going to be a theme all the way through. In 1406, there possibly was another great battle at Carlisle. There's an unreliable source mentions this, um, but they mention destruction at Cargo and Thruston Field and Brough by Sands, and Lanacost was burnt. So basically, they just kept coming in. And in 1409, the Assizes, the Justice Assizes, had to be held here at Penrith because they couldn't be held in Carlisle because there was too much going on. In 1412, there was a seven-year truce, and that was when we first get some evidence of Penrith Castle, which was probably built by Ralph Neville, who was still here at the time. It may have been started in the previous century. It seems to be fairly unclear when they actually started to build it, but certainly some work was done on it in 1412. Now, Carlisle Castle, remember, was already 400 years old at this time, so obviously Penrith was going to have the latest building technology. It was going to be a much more comfortable place to live than Carlisle Castle, basically. Not to mention the fact it was further away from the Scottish raids. So I think we can say that with Penrith Castle being occupied by the Nevilles, and the Nevilles being wardens of the West March all the time, in effect, the West March was run from Penrith all the way through the 15th century. Carlisle might have been officially the administrative centre, but this is where the power was. Now, it wasn't all war. In 1415, there was actually recorded a friendly joust between, England, between the English and the Scots at Carlisle. But later on that year, they came and attacked Penrith and burnt it. You can't trust them. So I'm sorry if anybody's Scottish here. This is all from the English point of view, but I'm sure the English gave as good as they got from time to time. So Penrith was burnt, and the English burnt Dumfries in retaliation. But by this time, um, the Percys had been reinstated because the king, King Henry V by this time, this was the heir of Agincourt, he realized that he was going to need some help up on the Scottish border that uh, the Scots were going to keep coming over and he really needed some strong men to be able to keep them back. And so he reinstated the Percys over in Northumberland. And from then on, Neville versus Percy became a feature of border life. In 1415 to 16, Cumberland was excused taxation in view of its losses at the hands of the Scots. So they were still having problems in paying their taxes. There just, there just wasn't the money around. An interesting one in 1420, there was wasting of the crops due to the dryness of the air. Now, how can it be dry air in Cumbria? It must have been absolutely freak weather that year. But also in that year, Richard Neville becomes the warden. And he was the son of Ralph Neville, so we're now on to the next generation. He later became the Earl of Salisbury. So I'm going to call him the Earl of Salisbury because that, it gets confusing otherwise with all these Nevilles. In 1421 is recorded, this is back to normal, grievous floods 
continual rains and tempests. So one year you've got the dry air, the next year you've got rains and tempests. You've also got three years of pestilence. So not surprisingly, they were beginning to get a bit worried about depopulation. There weren't many people left up here. Well, you can't blame them, can you? There was better uh, living to be had anywhere else you were going to leave, weren't you? Um, 1422, there's a record of William de Houghton. He had land in Penrith, but it was worth nothing because it was wasted. So you finally get to 1424 and a seven-year truce, and at last you get a bit of quieter period. Not much, but a bit quieter for a while. And during this time, there were general alerts. And one of the things that comes up over and over again is that when the, the warden had his um, indenture renewed, it was stipulated that he had to be in continual residence in the area. They didn't want somebody who was living over in Yorkshire and was never here. They wanted somebody here on the spot to look after them. So, the truce in uh, 1424, seven years, extended for five years later on, but there was no truce with the weather. We then get excessive floods, pestilence of beasts, choking of the corn, and eventually barley and malt had to be bought from East Anglia just to keep people alive. Now, up until now, the justice sessions had been held mainly in Carlisle, but from time to time in Penrith, alternating between the two places, and everybody seemed to be quite happy about that. But something different happened in the middle 1430s. Uh, Salisbury was actually confirmed as warden of the East March. Uh, sorry, he was, he was already warden of the West March. He was confirmed as warden of the East March as well for a couple of years, so that's going to split his time between the two. But King Henry VI gave him all the fines and forfeitures within Penrith and Sowerby, exclusive power of nominating justices and appointing coroners. So that was quite a lot of sort of judicial power that was given him. Now, whether because of that or maybe it was just coincidence, but they started having the justice sessions here in Penrith every year. So for several years, in the mid-1430s, the justice sessions came here. And the Carlisle citizens got a bit alarmed about this, and they thought that perhaps Penrith was going to become the judicial centre, and perhaps even they would make Penrith the county town instead of Carlisle. And so they petitioned the king for the sessions to be held at Carlisle. And I'm sorry, Penrith, but the king sided with Carlisle and said that the justice sessions had to take place there. But they were still arguing about this in 1537. It was a, a little niggle between the two places that didn't go away. 1436 was an extremely hard winter. And by this time, Salisbury was getting fed up with the job. He wasn't getting paid for a start. Well, what had happened was that the, the Hundred Years' War that had been going on with France all this time, it was coming to an end and England was losing. So basically, if there was any money in the Exchequer, it was going over to France to pay the soldiers to try and hang on to what we could from France. So there was no money for the borders. So Salisbury resigned. And the next warden was the new Bishop of Carlisle, who had the wonderful name of Marmaduke Lumley. I think that's a really brilliant name, Marmaduke Lumley. And he must have really wanted the job because he offered to take a pay cut. But even with his pay cut, he wasn't paid in full either. And we still had problems with the weather, scarcity of wheat, harvest failure due to heavy rain, plague in northern England and Scotland, and not surprisingly, famine. Now, in 1440, Joan Beaufort finally died. Now, whether that caused all sorts of problems with the inheritance, I'm not sure, but you would have thought that because the inheritance was to her and her husband and their sons, then the Earl of Salisbury, their eldest son, would have automatically got the manors of Penrith and, and Sowerby. But instead, he was granted the castle and manor of Penrith for three years, and he had to pay rent for it. So this is a bit odd. And he then transferred them to Cardinal Henry Beaufort, who was his mother's brother. 
And Salisbury himself was then appointed steward of all the lands which reverted to the crown on the death of his mother. So I'm not quite sure what was happening here, that the crown seems to have managed to get back all these lands. But eventually, in 1444, Salisbury and his wife received the regrant of the manor of Penrith for their lifetimes, and then that was later converted so that they could leave it to their sons. Meanwhile, poor old, poor old Marmaduke Lumley, even his estates were attacked by the Scots. They were said to have been ruined by dilapidations done by the Scots. But he hung on to the end of his, his tenure of office. And uh, then eventually, in 1446, he became the treasurer of England. I think he might have thought that was a nice, easy job in comparison. And guess who came back as the warden? Earl of Salisbury. Just in time for the worst outbreak of border warfare in the whole century. So, can we do a bit of audience research here? Who has heard of the Battle of Flodden in 1513? Most of you, I think. Who has heard of the Battle of Solway Moss in 1542? Quite a few people. Who has heard of the Battle of the River Sark in 1448? Nobody. And nor had I until I started doing this timeline. There's very little about it in the history books. It hardly gets a mention, in English history books, that is. If you go onto the Scottish website, which is the uh, Register of Scottish Battlefields, there's quite a lot about it. And that perhaps isn't surprising, given what happened. What seems to have happened is that James II of Scotland, who was by this time king, he had become very belligerently anti-English. On the other side, we'd got Henry VI as the King of England, and he was desperate for peace. Now, he visited York and Durham in 1448. And whether that's a coincidence or not, but in that year, the Scottish invaded again. And then they withdrew. And the English set off in pursuit. And the king said, oh, no, come back. No, 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 I want peace. I don't want you chasing the Scots. I don't want any more war. So he stopped it. Well, not surprisingly, that encouraged the Scots, and back they came again. And they got certainly as far as the suburbs of Carlisle, which they burnt. Upper Mill Mill was destroyed. Now, Henry at this stage, I think, realized that something had got to be done about this. So Henry Percy led a force of about 6,000 men, into Dumfrieshire, and they camped just south of Gretna, and he started raiding the area. So the Scots obviously didn't, and were going to retaliate to this, and about 4,000 Scots, led by Hugh Douglas, the Earl of Ormond, came and gave battle, and it was a heavy defeat for the English. Now they call it the Battle of Sark, but actually it took place between the River Sark on one side and the Kirtle Water on the other, um, round the Loch Mabenstone. It's sometimes called the Battle of the Loch Mabenstone. And about 2,000 English were killed. A lot of them were drowned because when they began to be pushed back, they tried to get across the Solway. And of course, the Solway, as you know, has very strange tides. And they got caught in the high tide and they couldn't get across the river and they got drowned. So that was a win for the Scots. Now that, to me, 10,000 people with 2,000 killed, that's quite a substantial battle. That's bigger than quite a lot of the battles in the Wars of the Roses. And yet you don't hear anything about it. Possibly because the English got defeated, but you know, certainly in Scotland, they know about it. So then, of course, you start getting the retaliations and the English burnt Dunbar over in the East Coast. It's recorded that they burnt Dumfries, although there's no confirmation of that. In return, the Scots wasted Annick Castle and Walkworth Castle. And it's reported that there were great ruinous decays and wastes in Cumberland generally. And they also attacked from the sea. There were pirates out in the Irish Sea as well. But in the end, uh, it came to an end with a, an indefinite truce in Durham, uh, which was then extended for three years. But it had been a pretty traumatic time. Now, we're getting to the point where there was all sorts of things going on in England, but it wasn't any better in Scotland. 
because in 1452, King James II actually murdered the Earl of Douglas. He stabbed him, killed him, just like that. And that set off a Scottish civil war. The Douglas supporters, of course, broke the truce whenever they could, just for their own benefit. So there was chaos in Scotland. The rivalry between the Nevilles and the Percys carried on. There's what's referred to as the clash on Heweth Moor. This apparently was a wedding. The, the Neville, one of the Nevilles was going to marry an heiress in Yorkshire and the bridal party went over to Yorkshire and Thomas Percy, who was actually based in Cockermouth, he laid a trap for this bridal party. It sounds like something out of an opera, doesn't it? Um, but both sides arrived mob-handed and a brawl broke out. Now, I don't think anybody was actually killed, but this was a sort of taster of what was still to come. This was 1453. This is just, just at the beginning of the Wars of the Roses and the Trouble. Um, Salisbury was confirmed as warden again, but this time jointly with his son. Now, his son, who was a, another Richard Neville, is known to history as Warwick the Kingmaker. This is where he comes in. So the two, father and son, were joint wardens of the West March. Quite how much time they were able to give to the West March is debatable because this was about the time that Henry VI was ill and the Duke of York took over temporarily and he made Salisbury his chancellor. So he was gonna be busy down in London the Earl of Warwick was made the captain of Calais, which was a very important job, so he was going to be busy across there in France. So who was running the march then? They were also, at this time, kept short of funds and very rarely actually to be seen in the West March. They weren't here at all. They were by this time beginning to lose favour because they'd supported the Duke of York the Lancastrian side were very suspicious of them, and so the Nevilles began to lose favour, and the Percys came up again. Now, around about this time, there's a, a sort of interesting little side issue that went on in the Isle of Man. The Isle of Man was held by the Stanley family. Now, they appear later on in history in Bosworth, but the, the King of Scotland, for some reason, decided he was going to conquer the Isle of Man. He claimed it for himself. And he set off from Kakubri and uh, attempted to land, but failed completely. And so the next year, William Stanley allied himself with Douglas. You remember the Douglas who was, it was, uh, the Douglas was killed, but his brother then took over as the Earl of Douglas. He was by then in England in exile, and the two of them got together, and poor old Kakubri got burnt and he ravaged the countryside, just because that was where the king had set off from. So be careful who you let people set off from in, in those days was the question. But the Scots were still raiding into England. Um, in 1457, they got down here as far as Penrith. Uh, they ravaged Crinkledyke near Kirk Oswald and then Blencarn, which I think is up here on the fell side, just to the east of Penrith. But they still managed to hold the justice sessions in Penrith that year. So it must have been really bad in Carlon if they had to come to Penrith again when we were being attacked down here. And that brings us to 1459, which is really when we get into the battles of the uh, Wars of the Roses. Uh, Salisbury really fell out of favour because he sided with the Duke of York. Him, he and Warwick definitely went into the Yorkist camp. And so his offices all his wardenship and so on, were given to Northumberland. Um, the leading Cumbrian families actually supported Lancaster. They plumped for the, the Lancastrian side. And so 1460, uh, we started getting battles, uh, Northampton, which is won by the Yorkists, and the Scottish king, obviously, was a bit of an opportunist. As soon as the Northampton battle was over, he thought, all right, everything's going to be in, in confusion down in England. He took advantage of that and attacked Roxburgh. And he actually did take Roxburgh, but when I say took it, he himself got blown up by one of his own cannon. He got a bit too close to it. Cannon were a bit 
new technology in those days, and you know, they did tend to blow up in people's faces. And uh, King James II got a bit too close and uh, got blown up. So it was his, actually his wife who actually took Roxburgh Castle. But then you get Wakefield. And the Yorkists were defeated at Wakefield. The Duke of York got killed, and Salisbury got killed as well. Now, actually, he didn't die in the battle. It might have been better if he had. He was captured. He was imprisoned in Pontefract Castle. But he must have been very unpopular over there for some reason, because he was extracted from the castle by the local people and lynched. So you have to feel a bit sorry for him. I mean, he was 60 years old by then. He'd, he'd given his life to running the West March. He, you know, really spent a lot of time looking after us here in the West March, and that's a sad end for him. Anyway, the, uh, the Lancastrians were in the ascendant at the time, so Penrith Castle, by this time, had fallen into the hands of marauders, with the wardens being absent, there was probably nobody to actually look after it. They used it as a base for operations. It had become a bit of a, a bad place. And so Lord Clifford was ordered to clear out the castle. Now, this is in October. Uh, on the last day of the year, the 31st of December, King Henry made Clifford constable of Penrith Castle and steward of the manor. Well, he didn't actually enjoy it for very long because that was the 31st of December. By the 29th of March, he was killed at Towton, or just before Towton, and he was attainted and his lands were forfeit to the crown. So, Towton, that's often shown as the last battle of this phase of the Wars of the Roses. It was a resounding victory for the Yorkists. However, Queen Margaret, Henry VI Queen Margaret, had promised Berwick to the Scots if they gave her assistance, which they did. And so she did give them Berwick. After Towton, she fled into Scotland and she promised Carlisle to the Scots if they would help her to reinvade England. Well, the Scots weren't going to turn that one down, were they? So there was a large-scale invasion by the Lancastrians and the Scots jointly. It was highly destructive, and it culminated in the siege of Carlisle. They burnt the suburbs, they burnt the mills, they burnt the gates. Now, if the gates were burnt, they must have actually got in. But who was going to resist them? Because the March defences had basically collapsed. All the people who should have been there had either been killed at Wakefield or killed at one of the other battles, or they'd gone over to the other side and they were actually fighting against them. So they had to raise some more troops down in the Midlands for a relief, a relief campaign. So the Siege of Carlisle, very few of the history books actually mention it. If they mention it at all, they just sort of put it as a footnote and say, oh, well, that was quickly dealt with. Um, a minor distraction, if you like. But it wasn't a minor distraction because the new king, Edward IV, actually postponed his coronation so that he could speed him northward because the Scots and rebels were besieging the Carlisle with great power. And it seemed that the sieges actually did break into the city and there's somebody called Richard Solkold who figures at this point because he was later rewarded for rescuing the city and castle of Carlisle from the rebels. So we don't know exactly what he did, but he obviously had some part in it. And the siege was finally broken by Lord Montague, who was Warwick's brother. And Penrith was returned to the Neville family in the person of the Earl of Warwick. But Lancastrian rebels were still active in the region. And the Scots continued to raid. And there was further trouble in 1470. This time it was actually stirred up by the Earl of Warwick. He was uh, trying to put the Duke of Clarence on the throne, who was the king's brother. 
And eventually he allied with Margaret of Anjou, who was still around, the king's widow, the old king's uh, wife, he was still alive at the time. And he led a rising, uh, and they actually managed to get rid of Edward IV for a while. He was over in Burgundy in exile. And at some point, the, there seems to have been, um, Carlisle Castle seems to have been against the king and the king sent orders to the mayor and citizens and they took control of the castle, which is an interesting way with all the soldiers and everything being in the castle. But the mayor and the citizens took control of the castle and held it for the king. This was briefly in 1470, but eventually the king was sent into exile. He came back the following year, he landed at Ravenspur and Sir William Parr, Parr's a good Cumbrian name, he led a force to support Edward. The battles of Barnet and Tewkesbury took place, Warwick was killed at Barnet, and finally, Penrith returns reverts to the crown and is given to Richard, Duke of Gloucester. And that's finally when Richard actually comes into the picture as Duke of Gloucester and he's made Warden of the West March. So that was what Richard, Duke of Gloucester, found when he arrived in the West March as the new warden. Great ruinous decays and wastes, widespread destruction, devastation by the Scots. Those are some of the descriptions that are given. So add to this the effects of the natural disasters and the destruction of the region's infrastructure by the civil wars in England. It was going to need a very able, hands-on leader to prevent the march from descending into chaos. And fortunately, in Richard, that is exactly what they got. That's it. <laughs>